Students, uh, 40 years ago, I was sitting on that side, in the audience, in my uniform. My uniform would have been a St. Hugh's uniform. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm now here on this side, 40 years later, and I have to say that sometimes it's easier not to know. It's absolutely easier not to know. Not to know what is happening in our state homes, not to know what is happening in communities downtown, not to know what is happening in families uptown. Sometimes it is just easier not to know. To be able to focus on our own individual lives and problems, and we all have them, and just keep the blinkers on and deal with my life and what I need to get done today. It's easier not to know. Um, many of you know, know firsthand some of the things that Moira has spoken about today. If these are not things that have happened to you personally, they've happened to friends. I know that there are many youngsters in this country who have become the confidant to a friend because you may be the only person that that friend feels safe talking with and telling the story to. And there are days when I feel ashamed and angry at us adults and how we have set things up and how we have run things and allowed things to continue because we are more concerned with the protecting the reputation of adults than we are with the well-being, protecting the well-being of children. I first heard of the fires, the fire at Armadale, when I was at leaving the, the Calabash Literary Festival where I had had a wonderful experience, cultural experience. It was a good weekend. And then I heard the news of this fire, and at first I couldn't understand, you know, how, how, how did this happen? And I have to say that when I began to hear the descriptions, first of all from the adults who ran the facilities and were responsible they gave the measurement of the room, and I, I thought, no, it can't be right. That, that, no, the, the lady who is saying this, she was, you know, she hadn't got the measurements of the room right. She was one of the security people. No, surely when we get the real measurements, it, it'll paint a different picture. And then we got the real measurements. 23, was it 23 feet? 20 feet by... 12, 20 feet by 12. And then they went on to say there were seven bulk beds, as it was said in Randy's um, poem. Seven bulk beds, 14 mattresses, 23 children, no, no, hold on. 14 mattresses, 23 children. Well, we know already that means doubling up on those mattresses. Right. By the time you put all of those into that room, where you walk, I mean, you get off the mattress and, and you go where? Okay, fine. And then we are told that they had a system called lockdown. And what lockdown meant was, from the morning you get up, they give you about an hour to go to the bathroom, which was outside of this room, and then you go back into the room, and they lock the door. You don't go to classes. You don't go to recreation on the sports field. You don't go to the dining room to eat. 
You spend what, 23 hours in this, pla in this place? And then at 9 o'clock, they lock off, sorry, 6 o'clock, they lock off any access to the bathroom and they put one or two open buckets into that room, 20 by 12, 14 mattresses, seven bunkers, 23 girls, and from six o'clock one night, clear round to six o'clock or seven o'clock the following morning, these 23 children are expected to use this bucket. Girls, in their teens, menstruating, no privacy. So how long does this lockdown go on? Well, in normal times, you go into the facility and they put you as the new person on lockdown for two weeks, they said, to get you accustomed to, you know, living in this new place. But when somebody does something wrong, one person or two people give trouble, they put the whole lockdown on lockdown. How long had they been on lockdown before the night of the Armadale fire? The shortest account, and there was difference in what was told, one month, 30 days on lockdown. Now I ask you, because I know about me, but if somebody put me in that situation, oh by the way I forgot to say, when you ate your food, because they would not allow utensils, knife and fork into the dorm room for you to eat your food, you have to use your hand to eat your food. Now, 30 days in that, tell me, slab roof, hot Jamaican weather, I don't know about you, but after 30 days, I would have been willing to tear out the bars myself and try to get out of that place. And when they tried to do what would come naturally to most of us, they were met with a response that ended up with a fire, that ended up with five dying that night, two more dying of their injuries, others badly burned and still dealing with those physical wounds and scars and others dealing with the psychological and emotional scars. We in Jamaica have no business to forget Armadale. We cannot simply move on, which is what a lot of people would like us to do. And when we hear our officials speak about Armadale, they would like to have us believe that all of those problems, if not already corrected, are well on the way to being corrected. It is not true. The Jamaican state owes every single one of those families not only financial compensation, but lifelong psychological support as long as they wish it and desire it. Every one of those children, all of their medical care, mental health care, needs to be care taken up by the state. And the reason I clapped when Professor Shepherd spoke about suspending maybe one fet in our 50th year celebrations in order to deal with that compensation is because we have got to give priority to what is important. <laughs> Mr. Goss 
spoke about the fact that earlier this year we learned, not unexpectedly, that Maxfield Park has no functioning fire extinguishers and the fire hydrant on the property isn't functioning. My thing is, in this 50th year, could we commit to fire extinguishers in homes for children rather than fireworks? We have no business spending one red cent on fireworks when the children's homes do not have fire So the problem is big. It's ongoing. And one of the things is, when you listen to all of this as young people, there must be times when you just say, you know what, this is all too much. This problem is too big. I can't do anything about this. Let me just turn away, go, <coughs> you know, watch my TV program, listen to my music, focus on my schoolwork, and really just, I, you know, not going to pay any attention to this. It's too hard. And what I want to encourage you is to understand, yes, it is hard. And right at this point in time, you are not the adults. The adults have their responsibility. But you have a responsibility. As Professor Shepard said, learn. Educate yourselves. Become aware. Don't become overwhelmed. Don't Lose your anger when you hear of these things. Use your anger. Direct it in to constructive ways. And I will share with you something which has helped me because, as Moira said, for me, I felt I had to go and listen to that every day of that inquiry. I missed only one, unavoidably. Because I felt as an adult in this country, I could not not listen. It was my responsibility to listen to what was said because so often we are not listening to what is being said. And it is one of, undoubtedly, one of the hardest things I have done in my 11 years at Jamaicans for Justice. But something that has helped me for a long time, and I share this story whenever I get the opportunity. In the early days of Jamaicans for Justice, one day I was sitting in the office with a young Canadian volunteer who was here for a year volunteering with us, a young man named Bruce. And at that time in the world, the Iraq war was breaking out. There were other um, um, major wars and disturbances around the world. Here in Jamaica, we were dealing with some really bad um, cases of, of police abuse, um, uh, extrajudicial killings. A lot was going on, and it felt very heavy and overwhelming. There was so much that needed to be done. And Bruce turned to me and he said, but you know, Susan, we are not called on to fix the whole world. We are only called on to take the next right step. And that has become a mantra for me. There is always the next right step to take. The next right step might be to read the report on Armadale. The next right step might be to, a list, to be a listening ear to somebody who has a problem they need help with. The next right step might be sitting in a coroner's court while a mother has to listen to the pathologist's report of the beating that her son endured before he was shot and killed by the police. The next right step might be when a friend makes a joke about somebody that you feel uncomfortable about but don't want to say anything because maybe they'll start to joke about you too. Maybe summoning up the courage to say, I don't really find that funny and I'm not going to join in the laughter. The next right step might be to learn as much as I can about a situation that I want to see change. 
the next right step may be a letter to a, a, to a newspaper, might be a word to my counselor, guidance counselor at school if I know that a fellow student is undergoing some real problems and needs help. The next right step always presents itself to us in our own life, in the moment that we are in. And that's what we're called on to take. And it's what I ask all of you today to think about. You're sitting on that side now. In another 40 years, you'll be sitting somewhere else with a certain level of skill and experience, with a voice that can continue to speak, and with power to do something about what faces you. Thank you for listening, and I encourage you to commit to taking your next right step.